Crucial to understanding alien life is natural selection, a process that should take place across the whole universe. It means that creatures best adapted to their environment don't get killed as much, allowing them to go on to produce the next generation. Each generation experiences random hereditary changes, which can be advantageous or disadvantageous for survival. The advantageous changes then stack up over many generations, which we call evolution, and the best creatures keep surviving and evolving and surviving and evolving over millions of years until we get new species. Therefore, the environment of a group of creatures forces them to evolve particular adaptations. This means that if you take two completely unrelated animals and shove them into the same environment, after a few million years they'll start to look very similar. Their body designs will converge, so we call it convergent evolution. The upshot is that if you land on an alien planet with similar environments to those of Earth, you will recognise a lot of the animals there. In the oceans you'll find sharks, with their torpedo shaped bodies maximally adapted to shooting through water at breakneck speed. And in the rivers you'll find crocodiles, with their long narrow jaws maximally adapted to trapping those slippery torpedo shaped creatures of the water that we call fish. We know from the fossil record that these design templates have independently evolved many times in prehistory, and given the same environments, will reliably evolve again and again. In particular, crabs have evolved independently at least five times from decapod crustaceans, so many times that we have a name for the process of evolving a crab, carcinization. But what if your alien planet doesn't possess these same environments? What if the oceans are more or less viscous? What if the atmosphere is thicker or thinner? We can make some predictions. Let's start with plants. The thinner the atmosphere, the weaker the wind, the less robust the plants. Expect thinner stems. What about gravity? Well, the weaker the gravity, the lighter the load of any material, so those plants should be able to carry larger leaves. Most interestingly, what about the planet's star? It's difficult to predict how this would affect the colour of the leaves. It's thought that our planets have green leaves because of competition before plants had even evolved. The competitor in question, purple sulphur bacteria, absorbed all of the green light, making it vital for the ancestors of plants, cyanobacteria, to absorb the other colours, mainly red and blue. For whatever reason, the cyanobacteria were more successful in the end. The purple sulphur bacteria died out, leaving the green cyanobacteria to thrive. Ironically, the sun's optical output actually peaks in the green band of wavelengths. So ignore anyone who tells you that the vegetation on a planet orbiting a red dwarf will be adapted to absorb red light and therefore have blue leaves. Not so. Actually, the most efficient plants in the universe should be completely black. That is, they will make use of all colours and so not reflect any light at all. Now let's talk about animals. You need to tell the difference between predator and prey. The most important principle here is specialisation. The idea that it's better to focus on being really good at just one thing than being mediocre at lots of things like a jack of all trades. Specialisation is why we have different kinds of organs that excel at their own specialised roles, instead of having a homogeneous goop that can do a bit of everything but none of it very well. Because of specialisation, you'll pretty much always find a mouth to feed a specialised digestive system you can call the guts. Most of the time, the part of the animal that contains the mouth will also contain the brain and the primary sensory organs. You can call this part the head. Heads have evolved independently at least three times on Earth. This is a type of specialisation process we call cephalization. Look very closely at the head. There will almost certainly be a set of eyes, which have evolved independently over 40 times on Earth. Eyes are really bloody useful. If the eyes are facing forward, offering depth perception, you're probably looking at a predator. If the eyes look sideways, giving a wider field of vision, you're probably looking at prey. Now look at the mouth. If the mouth parts look like they're for penetration, it's probably best to run away, obviously. Depending on the plants of the planet, herbivorous teeth are usually flat and rough for grinding and chewing. If you can, the best thing to do is observe the alien animal from a distance. Watch how it behaves. Primary consumers, usually the placid herbivores, must spend most of their time eating because of the inefficient energy transfer between trophic levels. See my previous video. Another clue is the size of the animal, which depends on a number of factors. A common trope in sci-fi is that animals living under higher gravity conditions are short and stout. However, the most useful thing to realise is that larger animals should be easier to outrun. Yes, recent evidence suggests you probably could have outrun a T-Rex. Gravity affects all creatures the same way, and extra mass is always heavier, which is exacerbated by the stresses of running. 
Be aware, however, that an oceanic environment can support extra weight and therefore allow animals to grow larger while not compromising too much in speed. See the blue whale, the largest animal ever to have lived on Earth. Those are the basics then. That should be enough to keep you out of trouble while you're waiting for your team's exobiologist to awake from their stasis pod. Just don't stare into any black gooey eggs in the meantime.